Uh, we have an incredible guest, uh, someone that I just personally met tonight. But we have a history that goes way back. But he is Pastor David Rosales. Uh, from uh, He's the senior pastor at Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Uh, let's welcome him. Uh, he also served in the Army, yes, the 82nd Airborne Division. So uh, he's in the Lord's Army, but he's been in the military. So let's welcome David, Pastor David. Welcome. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. We're so delighted. You were, uh, let, let's kind of reach back. Where, where did your story begin back in the 60s? That now you pastor a, a very huge church, but let's get to that a little later. But let's, let's go back. I saw on your website a picture of you back in 1969. Where does your story begin? <laughs> well, I can... <laughs> I was born and raised here in California. I'm one of the few people who actually were born here. Okay. And um, I'm from Mexican-American heritage. My grandparents all came from uh, Mexico and in the um, early 1900s. And so my mom and dad were actually first-generation Americans. And so as I grew up here in the United States as a Mexican-American, I was raised in the traditions of uh, the Roman Catholic faith. And so from the time I was uh, like eight years old, I made my first communion. When I was uh, 12 years old, I made my confirmation. But uh, for me, there was an emptiness. There was something that was lacking. I had religious training, but even as Dwight just mentioned, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so my mom was, was ill as a little boy. I was about four years old when my mom had her first epileptic seizure. And I grew up believing that my mom was going to die almost any day. And so I lived in constant concern for her. So trying to be a good boy and trying to be a good Catholic boy, I, um, I did the best that I could to, to take pressure off of her. But by the time I was 15, I just realized that all the good things I tried to do were not affecting her health. And so I turned from being that good little boy into somebody who began to, to use alcohol and that moved into the marijuana, and then later on to the uh, hallucinogenics, you know, like psilocybin and mescaline and uh, THC and acid and uh, magic mushroom. I, I, I went into a variety of experiences with drugs and alcohol until I was about 20 years old. Mm. When I was about 19, I began to realize that there was something missing in my life, but I wasn't sure exactly what that was yet. I, didn't have the name Jesus at the forefront of my mind. There was just an emptiness, a loneliness, a sorrow. There was something that was missing. And so I, I got more heavily involved in, in the drugs and alcohol abuse. And during that time, I started seeing things happen that um, really began to affect me. I used to deliver flowers for a uh, florist shop in Whittier. And I was delivering flowers one day to Rose Hills. And I read the card on the flowers that I was to place on the casket, and it was the name of somebody I thought I knew. But I thought, he's only 19 years old. It couldn't possibly be him. And you can't imagine what I felt like when I placed this funeral wreath and looked into the face of a friend of mine that I had been smoking pot with and dropping drugs with just a week before. Uh -huh. I had another friend of mine by the name of Dave Smith, and Dave and I were high school buddies. And he was a dear friend of mine, and one day uh, I saw Dave at a, a local Tasty Freeze, and uh, I remember him turning to me and saying, Hey, Dave, I'll see you later. And I said, Yeah, I'll catch you later. And that night he drank, he dropped some drugs, took some acid, got on his motorcycle, drove head-on into a uh, parked pickup truck and died instantly. Uh. Then I have another friend named Ray, who was very dear. He was my friend since we were five years old who one day decided to go to a party across the street from where I lived. And as uh, he went to the party and was there, my mom had said, David, she said to me, please, I've got a bad feeling. Don't go to that party tonight. So I, for once in my life, for a long time, I obeyed her. And uh, I didn't go. But that night, Ray got in a fight with another guy I used to know. 
and um, the guy, um, and he began to fight. And one of my friends uh, went home, got his gun, came back, and when Ray dove to take this guy down to fight, my friend shot and killed my other friend, Ray Cazada. And uh, these things that were happening were just so, uh, so changing in my life. Just I was coming to realize there was just a lot of violence, a lot of bad things happening. My drug use was destroying me, destroying my family. Um, my parents were constantly in pain and hurt over what I was doing and how I was being. And, um, and I, I just, there was nothing I could do to change. And so one day, um, some friends of mine and I decided to, to get high. And I dropped uh, five uh, reds, we called them reds, second all. And I drank almost a half gallon of wine. And uh, I was laying in the back of, uh, of my, my car and uh, I almost died. And as I was laying there about to vomit and I, would, I was unable to move because I was paralyzed, I, I cried out to God. I said, God, I'm too young to die, I'm only 19. And, uh, you know, and I passed out, but obviously I didn't die because here I am. But the next, the next morning I wake up and um, I got the empty bottle of uh, wine and threw it across into a field, continued on and kept, continued going downhill. At that time, the Jesus movement was catching steam. And uh, some friends of mine were going to a little church called Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And um, they were listening to some young evangelist as well as Pastor Chuck Smith. And the young evangelist was Lonnie Frisbee. And so uh, I had the long hair, as you saw in my picture. I had the long hair and, and all of that. And um, one of my friends who's here tonight, my friend Bill, uh, said, uh, I want to take you to church. But I was raised a Catholic, and I said, why would I want to go to your church? You're a Protestant, man. You don't even know God. And why would you have me go to some place that I know he's not at? But he just kept on saying, you need to go. You really need to go. And so uh, I smoked some pot, and I drank some beer. And I was barefoot, and I had, you know, messed up clothes. And I knew for sure that they would kick me out, right? Because my church would have kicked me out if I walked in like that. So I, I could call them all hypocrites. And so I, I walked in, and you cannot imagine how surprised I was when, when the, the preacher was freakier looking than I was, you know? And, <laughs> and, and I and looked at him, and I go, well, this is, this is not right. You know, I like this place, you know? And so they gave a message of the gospel Arthur, but uh, I, I really thought I was a Christian. I just wasn't practicing my faith. For me, my hope for heaven was to marry a good Catholic woman who would pray my soul out of purgatory, and, and that was as much as I was going to get out of life, right? And so what happened is uh, uh, I got worse. You know, I started going into deeper and deeper spiral, and then it was December 27th, and uh, a friend of mine was about to receive uh, a kilo of uh, marijuana from Thailand. We used to have it shipped to us in stuffed animals, because at that time they didn't have the drug sniffing dogs at the airport and all of that. And so we would have it shipped to us. And so I, it was December 27th. I was going to celebrate Christmas by getting high. And so I went to my friend's house to tell him, um, sorry, I've got some other business. I can't make it today. But uh, he had parked his, his van behind my car. And so as I was waiting to pull out, I was looking in the rearview mirror, and I saw all these heads disappear for a moment. Then they came back up, and my friend came up and knocked on my window, and I rolled it down, and he said, we just talked to God. God says you have to go. Turn off your car. You're coming with us. So I was literally kidnapped. And so I said, well, if God says so, I better do it, right? And so <laughs> I went and climbed in this van. I went to the Hollywood Palladium, and they were having a Maranatha concert. And as I was there listening to all this music, they had Pat Boone and his family and, and, and various people, um, I started becoming aware of some things that, you know, I was hearing a message that I'd never really listened to and began to realize that um, there was something missing in me. And, and the Holy Spirit, I believe he still can speak to you in a still, small voice. And, and as I was there, uh, I, I remember everybody was standing up and they had their arms around one another and they were swaying to the music because we used to do that at that time and and they were singing love 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 christians this is your call love your neighbor as yourself for god loves all as that was taking place i had my hands in my pockets
because I didn't know these people next to me, and my friends were standing behind me, and uh, and I be and I heard the voice of the Lord again, and and He said, "You're uncomfortable," and I said, "Yes," <laughs> and He says, "Why?" And I said, "Because I'm not like these people," and He said, "What is different?" And I said, "I am not a Christian." That was the first time I'd ever admitted, even to myself, that I didn't know Jesus Christ. And so as I was there, my friend George says, uh, David, and I turn around, and he and Lori open up a space between them, and I went and put my arms around them. They sang, and I held on to them, and I knew what they have, I need. And so when you came out and preached, Arthur, and you shared, I don't remember your message, but I remember this. I remember at a point, you said, if you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ, stand to your feet. And there were 4,000 kids sitting on a carpeted floor there, and you remember the Hollywood Palladium, how you preached there. And uh, we were all, all these hippie kids, we didn't need chairs, we just sat on the carpet. And you said, if anybody needs Jesus, stand to your feet. And I said to Jesus, I said, I want you, but I am afraid to stand. I can't stand because you know I'm shy. But if someone stood with me, I would stand. And you said, Arthur, you said, perhaps you're afraid to stand by yourself, but if someone would stand with you, would you stand? And I stood up that day, December 27, 1970, and I've been standing up for Jesus ever since. Listening to that, I just think of all the invitations that I've given around the world, uh, in every nation in the world, and inviting people. And we just met tonight, right yes. back at the back, only for like two minutes. And and Jesus then had a trail for you because he had a destiny. Amen. Now, how did you? grow in Christ, and what do people need to know? Just kind of uh, without going into all your story, what do people know from conversion? Because I know there are many people listening that, that have made a commitment, and then they're still stuck back. You came out. What was the difference? They need to know that the Word of God is alive, that God changes lives. They need to know that. The Word of God is alive. When I got saved, when I got saved, I came home. I came home that night. The first thing I did is went across the street to go share with the people I was going to smoke dope with. They weren't there, but I shared with the parent, with the mama. I went home. I walked into my, into my den, and I said, Mom, Dad, Madeline, Becky, I love you. Praise the Lord. And they, they freaked out because my mom thought I was loaded. And so she, she went and did a, a rosary for me. And so... But my sister Madeline said, what happened to you? And I said, Jesus Christ came into my life and changed me today. Amen. And Amen. So, yes. so she gave her heart. She gave her heart to Jesus Christ that night. She is the first person who ever committed her heart to Christ through my ministry. And it's just preaching. Jesus Christ changes lives. And then my brother Frank, a couple of years later, my dad and my mom, three weeks later, were inside their, their kitchen. And I was reading Revelation. I was told, read the Bible, because you're going to grow that way. I was reading Revelation 9, and I came walking into the kitchen. I said, Mom, Dad, this is the Word of God. Listen to what God has to say. <laughs> and I'm three weeks old in the Lord, Amen. but I'm already sharing the gospel with him, right? And so I said, this is what the Word of the Lord says. And I read Revelation 9 about women, men with women's hair, iron teeth, scorpion stings, one and I said, I don't know what this means. But I said, I do know this. I said, it's not speaking to me, it's speaking to you. Uh -oh. and, I, and I said, Daddy, I said, you are a good man. You are the best man that I will ever know. But you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. Oh. And I said, wow. Wow. And I said, 
I said, I love you, and I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head. You're giving your heart to Jesus right now. My dad gave his heart to Christ. My mom gave her heart to Christ. It's all the word of God. One last thing that I might add is this. My sister Rebecca went into a homosexual lifestyle for almost 30 years. And we prayed for her, and we prayed for her. And in 1998, I gave an invitation. She lives in New Mexico. I gave an invitation, and the last people to come walking up the aisle was my dad, my mom, and my sister, Rebecca, who turned away from lesbianism and is serving the Lord Jesus Christ right now. And one last thing. One last thing. I was talking to Becky just yesterday. I said, honey, do you mind if I share how you had a, a lesbian lifestyle? And she said, David, share it, I, because I'm set free from it. But she said, but she said this. She said, when I was living this lifestyle, the thing that hurt me the most was that my daddy would not walk me up the aisle to get married. She said, but I saw a picture of when I got saved and I had my arm through my daddy's arm and my mama's on the walking up the aisle to marry Jesus Christ. And that's, uh. and that's what she did. She said, I have, I found the perfect man. I am married to Jesus Christ. And he is uh. The word of God, the word of God rightly divided, the word of God rightly divided, proclaimed with courage that transforms lives when received by faith. That's what the church needs to return to right now, Arthur, is preaching God's word. No compromise, God's word. Right, right. Would you invite from our audience that goes around the world, many people are struggling just like you were talking about. Maybe they don't have a drug problem, but they have a, a, a discouragement problem. Maybe they've lived a lifestyle of that, that, that's broken their lives. Maybe they've had disappointments and heartaches and heartbreaks. Uh, would you call them to Christ and yes. give an invitation like it was when you received Christ? Yes. There's a God-shaped hole in every person's heart. And only God himself can meet that need. You can try to fill it with drugs, relationships, success, education, you name it. It'll still be there because only God by His Spirit can change your life. Every human being is lonely. And what we're doing is we're trying to find something to meet that lonely need. So we might have a relationship. It never will. We might have a job. It never will. The only one who can is Jesus Christ. And what's blocking you from Him is your sin. It's not your mistakes, it's not your errors, it's not your way you were raised, it is you and your sin. Your sin needs to be dealt with. Confess to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner, forgive me. I don't deserve heaven, I deserve hell. But if I can open my heart to you now and you will forgive me, your word says that you will, then I receive you right now as my Lord and my Savior because you are ever ready to save those who call upon you. And so Jesus loves us, he laid his life down for us, and what we do is we open our heart to him. And if you have a desire to have a relationship with Christ, I'd encourage you to repent. Turn from your sin and to turn to him and open your heart to him. And if you say to him, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me. Transform me. God says, I will make you a brand new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that is a promise from God you can bank on. Jesus Christ will save you. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I was uh, looking through your website. I have uh, many times, and I've, I've seen the emphasis and the teachings. And tell us just a word about now you're a pastor, and and uh, and what kind of pastor are you? Uh, uh, coming <laughs> out know. of that background, a compassionate pastor, I'm sure, but. What, what about your church? I have a church, you know, I pastor a group of people that I love with all of my heart. They're more than just, here I get emotional, forgive me. Um, I love them with all of my heart because, because God entrusted them to my care. And so I didn't go into the ministry for fame and I didn't go into the ministry for finances. I went into the ministry because there's nothing else that I can do. I, I am called and I want my people to know Jesus Christ. I want them to love Jesus Christ. I want them to take the word of God out 
to a hurting world to love them, to teach the truth, and to win the loss, because that's what we need right now. We need revival. And so I try and encourage my church, love Jesus, because guess what? He loves you first, and he loves you more. Oh, wonderful. And thank you so very much. And there are many of you looking for a compassionate uh, church and pastor of uh, Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Uh, is there for you with a man who understands. I, I love you, and it's uh, very, very emotional and touching to see you. Uh, and uh, after all these years, and to hear your journey. And uh, aren't you happy to have him in the t uh, TBN audience? Uh,